In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Very nice to be with you here. Uh, last week we had fun going over all sorts of different questions, uh, questions or uh, slogans, I think, that Seth Baker had come up with, slogans and questions that Christians don't want anyone to ask. And uh, some of them were tricky for me to answer. I, I went in blind, uh, and so some of them were tricky, and some of them were... I think there's at least one softball, so I'm glad Seth sort of made that one easy for me. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and I hope if you haven't had the chance to uh, listen to that or watch it, that you will go back through our archive. You can uh, watch our videos on our website, veracityhill.com, or find us on Facebook, Veracity Hill, where we live stream, or from time to time pre-record episodes that we upload there. But every Saturday, 1 p.m., we've got new material for you week after week. On today's episode, we are uh, joined by Dr. Braxton Hunter, and we're going to be uh, talking about uh, his recent debate with uh, an atheist by the name of Matt Dillahunty. If you've heard of uh, Matt, he has a program on uh, YouTube, I believe, uh, that is called The Atheist Experience, which is a very popular program, and somehow uh, he seems to dupe Christians into calling in all the time, and these people go in unprepared, and it just ser serves as confirmation bias for these atheists watching this program, which is really a shame. Uh, but from time to time, I think I think there have been a few intellectual Christians that come on and, and chat with him. He has an open phone line. Uh, all right, well, so let's just jump right to it. Uh, Dr. Braxton Hunter is the uh, president of uh, Trinity Seminary. It's got a longer name, and Braxton, I'll let you go through that. You've been on our program before, so it's great to have you back again. Well, thanks for having me back, Kurt. And yes, it's Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary at Trinity S-E-M dot E-D-U. I just, so there you, go. you know, I, I run Defenders Media. I just think in web domains, so at Trinity Sem dot E-D-U. So yeah. Trinity Sem. Yeah. So it's kind of like Donald Trump. He, he remembers uh, the CEOs by their first name and the name of their company. So for those that are following along, <laughs> it's not Tim Cook, it's Tim Apple. And it's also yeah. uh, Marilyn Lockheed. Uh, so it's very funny how. But hey, he's a business guy, and that works for him. So <laughs> Sounds good. Kurt Hill. Kurt Veracity. Yeah, yeah, something right. Like yeah, something like that. Veracity Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so you had this uh, awesome opportunity, Braxton, to uh, debate um, Dill Hunty. He's a uh, popular atheist out there, especially on the Internet. He's got a very large Internet following. Uh, and so it's important for Christians to engage with folks uh, on the Internet in a constructive way, because if we don't do that, well, then, you know, where's the, where's the gospel? Where's the good message on the Internet? Uh, where are those that are contending for the faith and defending uh, true and right doctrine? So that's very important stuff. So it's great that you had the chance. And, and to do it, of all places, at Baylor, that was a... Yeah. Very wonderful opportunity you had there. And the, the debate question was, does the Christian God exist, right? That's right, yeah. First, uh, tell me, what was the thinking behind determining that question? Okay, so um, last summer, I guess, July of last summer, maybe June, Leighton Flowers, who's the head for Texas Baptist Apologetics, uh, contacted me and said, look, we're going to do one of these. They do these you know, multiple times a year, the Unapologetics Conference. And if you live in Texas, you ought to go. It's a fantastic conference. And he said, we're going to do one in February in Waco, Texas, and I want to do a debate to get some interest for this thing. And I think I can get Matt Dillahunty to do it. He, he did a debate here with Mike Lycona in 2017 for the conference. So um, would you be willing to debate him? Well, I didn't know a whole lot about Matt Dillahunty, but I'd seen the clips you just referenced from the atheist experience and the vulgarity and the aggressive nature of those calls and the blasphemy and all, you know, all that stuff. And so I was like, whoa, man, I don't know. Couldn't we get like Michael Shermer or something? You know, I was trying to, I was trying to think this thing through. And he said, well, you know what, Braxton, if you don't want to do it, maybe Mary Jo or Frank Turek will do it. Maybe, maybe they'd be happy to do it. I was like, now, hold on just a second. Now, wait just a minute. Hold on now. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me think about this. Give me a minute. And he gave me every bit of that minute and not a second longer. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I agreed to debate. And so for the next eight months, I guess, I was preparing for that. And um, 
So, it, yeah, the, does the Christian God exist? So Leighton asked me, well, what would you want to debate? Well, one thing that a lot of Christians and atheists alike criticize about these debates is that so often it's just, does God exist? When the Christian is obviously a representative for the Christian God, right? And I don't blame guys who do the does God exist debate. I've done one of those too. I think that's that's perfectly fine. But I, I'm an evangelist and I'm an apologist second and an evangelist first. I wanna see people come to Christ. So I, you know, even though I think that there's a place academically and in apologetics for does God exist, I wanted to discuss specifically Jesus and the Christian God. So I wanted, does the Christian God exist for that reason? And just take it by the horns. I thought if I'm going to debate Matt Dillahunty, let's just make it harder on myself and just go all in. Yeah. Now that seems like it's a, uh, a harder question to uh, approach because you know, with the does God exist, it doesn't seem like there's as much to prove, so to speak. Not that God's existence needs proving, but for some people that, you know, they might perceive that. Uh, whereas you've got to go a step further then. So, you know, from from trying to woo over atheists, you've got to get them first to think that God exists and then also that the particular God exists. So that was certainly harder, but I like your approach taking, you know, just going full steam. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, so I decided, and maybe this is something you want to question me about later, but I decided I would do kind of a classical apologetics approach and give two arguments for God's existence and then a case for the resurrection. But there were some things unique about that, but, but that's the approach I took. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, uh, for those that haven't watched your debate, what were the, you know, what were the arguments you led with? What did he say with, what were the responses? So let's start going through it. Yeah, there's a little bit of an origin story here. And so I'm sorry, I don't mean to suck the area out of, out of the room, but I, um, a, a few years ago, you know, I've done several debates, theological debates with Calvinists. And, um, I, you know, th this is an in-house debate. They're my brothers and, and everything and all the other caveats I'm supposed to say. But I had debated Calvinists. And so, uh, but I, I really felt convicted that from my ministry as an evangelist, I needed to go back to apologetics with unbelievers. Mm. And so... I was thinking about this and I was a little bit sad because it was like, well, you know, I have all this knowledge now about the nature of human freedom and how all that works and determinism, compatibilism, libertarian freedom, all that stuff. I don't want that to just go to waste. So I prayed that God would give me a way to use that in apologetics and evangelism with skeptics. And so what I, so I was praying one day and uh, as I was praying about this, I thought of William Lane Craig's moral argument, which is a modus tollens, you know, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. Yep. And I thought you could so easily remove the objective moral values and duties do, and in, in, in place of that put libertarian freedom does, so that you'd have, if God does not exist, then uh, libertarian freedom does not exist. Libertarian freedom does exist, therefore God exists. And so I, I started working on that argument and I first threw it out there as red meat to the theological determinist friends I had. And uh, they, they took to it and they were really perplexed by it because on the one hand, they wanted to agree with me on God's existence, but they couldn't grant my libertarian freedom. <laughs> <laughs> But the criticisms that came were very much the criticisms that I expected. So I knew I was on the right track. And what was great about it is, for those that might be familiar with Craig's moral argument, some of his defenses of his premises actually work for this argument too. Hmm. Um, and so there's a lot to go through there, but, uh, but just uh, simply put, um, you know, one, one thing that we could say is, someone might say, yeah, but the thing about the moral argument is even though it's not an appeal to emotion, that is, you're not trying to say, Look how awful it would be if we don't have moral values and duties. Um, you're, you're instead playing on someone's immediate awareness that morality is real in that way. Nevertheless, it does pack an emotional punch. You know, I think that the libertarian freedom argument that I constructed also packs that emotional punch uh, and can be defended. Well, it can be defended in a couple of ways. But anyway, that simply put, it gives you the same moral punch, uh, free. It gives the same emotional punch that the free will, uh, the moral argument does. Because if God does not exist, or if libertarian freedom does not exist, then that means that whatever you find yourself doing, whether you're a racist engaging in a, a hate crime or a sex offender, or you build wells for thirsty people in Africa, or are a philanthropist, 
whatever good, bad, good or bad thing you end up doing, you were just determined to do it. Right. And so it gets you to, in a different way, a similar moral point, not the same moral point. So anyway, I brought that as my first argument. And um, then I brought the Kalam cosmological argument. And then lastly, I brought a resurrection case. So that, those were the arguments that I brought. And I, there's actually something that's not unique to me about the resurrection case, but that I don't think it's highlighted enough. And if at some point you want to talk about that, I'd be happy to explain that. Yeah. So first, let's start with the, the first argument you used, which is, um, you know, this is a uh, new territory, I think, maybe uh, <laughs> implementing a debate like this or, or an yeah. argu argument like this. So basically what you're what you're trying to do with it is to say, hey, if atheism is true, then there is no libertarian free will. There's no robust sense of freedom uh, that's good enough for human responsibility. And um, the, the, right. the if, atheist if, is, atheist, if atheistic naturalism is true, then your mental states reduce to brain states, which reduces to biology, which is external to you, is, is you know formed by events external to you. So you just have a real serious determinism. Right. And so for the so-called free thinkers out there, uh, they're yeah. not exactly free. <laughs> but the last thing they are is a free thinker because you just hit on something that's so valuable. And that is that it's not just your actions that are determined, but your thoughts and your beliefs are also determined. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's yeah. for people that don't want God to exist because they want mm -hmm. their freedom. They give their freedom up when they act as if God doesn't exist. And, and right. And, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, and that's why it doesn't, you know, it's not consistent. The fact that they are free creatures is not consistent with the worldview they want to adopt. Right. And that's why, even though I think this was easily defended in the debate, um, I think it's probably most helpful with personal evangelism, doing apologetics with real people, because your atheistic debaters are mostly going to have thought about these things and they're going to be determinists. But your friend at work, who's an atheist, probably thinks he has libertarian freedom unless he's thought too much about this um, libertarian freedom being what you and I might call real free will. You know, the, the idea that I'm the originator of my actions, my choices, nothing external to me made me do whatever I do. Most people think that the general population demonstrably thinks that um, there've been studies on that, uh, that I was prepared to present in the debate. But uh, so anyway, yeah, I think it could be really good for everyday discussions with people and you could pretty well defend it like you would the moral argument. Uh, but uh, in the debate, I think it went well. Now, there's one mistake that some viewers of the debate are making that Matt himself makes. Matt has a tactic where and I don't he might deny this if he if he was sitting here with us, but it certainly is there. And it is basically the debate is framed up such that, look, I don't believe your God exists. And then whatever pr evidence we pre present, he'll just say, well, that doesn't convince me as if winning the debate is reducible to convincing Matt to be a Christian. You know, if that's the case, he didn't convince me to be a skeptic either. So I guess we both win. You know, we both get trophies. <laughs> but, <laughs> Participation but, trophies. Yeah, yeah. But the thing about it is uh, that's so. So what he's saying is, well, look, I don't believe in libertarian freedom. So I don't know how this argument is supposed to convince me that God exists. I don't believe in either one of those things. Yeah, you don't. But you know what? Those people back there or out there in the audience, they do believe in libertarian freedom. And you're not the only person we're talking to here, Matt. And though I'd love you to come to Christ today, and we've got an organ sitting over there, we could play just as I am, and you could come to Christ. <laughs> I'm not counting on it. And so for these people who are being realistic about life in, in general, yep. it's for them. Yeah, nice. All right, so your second argument uh, was the Kalam, uh, which is a specific type of cosmological argument, so looking at the origin of the universe. And I'm, I'm sure many folks in apologetics are familiar with that uh, due to the work and ministry of, of Dr. William Lane Craig. Um, so I don't th I don't think we have to yeah who, I don't think we have to get uh, too much into that one. But basically, looking well, there is something worth saying about that. I think, and and that is when so all of Matt Dillahunty's fans will say, "Man, Matt has debunked this argument so many times." But if you'll listen to what Matt says about it, and all you have to do is go to go to YouTube and search for uh, the atheist experience and Kalam or something like that. And what you'll see is that he says two things or three things pretty much. First, he'll say, look, the conclusion of the Kalam argument is not that God exists, right? Everything that begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause for its existence. Nothing there about God. 
Therefore, it's not an argument for a God. Now, is it? He'll say to the caller. And they'll say, well, no, but it says, no, no, no. It's not an argument for God. So, so yeah. when, when he says that, he's only critiquing the shortened version of the argument. He's obviously unfamiliar with the longer version in the academic literature. Sure, yeah. Because then we build on to that and we can get to these other things that are, you know, implications right. of that. You right. know? So, so, but anyway, so when I, when I came to the debate, I, I framed it that way. Oh, the other thing he says that I also addressed is even if he grants you a whole ball of wax and says, fine, you need a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful mind as the cause, but it might not be a God. It could be a group of universe creating pixies. And there you just respond the way that other apologists have in the past. And Craig's done this when people have said it could just be some computer or something is you say, OK, look, uh, fine. It's a it's a group of pixies. But Occam's razor says you shave away all the unnecessary explanatory variables. So we'd be left with one universe creating pixie. So we have a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful universe creating pixie. All you've done is described God and called God a pixie. So I'd like to welcome you to theism, you pixie theist. <laughs> <laughs> so I said that in my opening statement. Nice. But, <laughs> but uh, so those are the two things he says. And yeah. then the other answer is just, I don't know. Now, if that's debunking the Kalam, then goodness, you can debunk anything with that sort of talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not debunking the Kalam. But anyway, so he stepped into the trap. So in the rebuttal, he said, look, the Kalam is not an argument for God. You know, he said that whole thing. Wow. And so I said, well, look, man. Uh, I told you uh, in my opening statements, I didn't say I'm bringing the Kalam. I said I'm bringing a case that begins with the Kalam cosmological argument. And then we were off and running in a real discussion of it. So I think it went well from there. Yeah, good. Now, um, the resurrection argument. What did you present here? Okay, so <clears throat> the way I began this was, so if you read the, the relevant books on the resurrection, uh, they will point out that so if you took a classical apologist like William Lane Craig, even in reasonable faith, he'll point out that you, you want to, you know, this comes on the back of the theistic arguments to show you that God exists, right? Because if God exists, now you've got a sufficient power to do something like a resurrection. And they'll point out Jesus' self-conception, what he thought about himself and what Jesus thought about himself. And this is universally, I called Mike Lycona before the debate and I said, I really want to get this right. I see what you've written in your book on this. I see what others have said, but you know, I want to know, is this still true? And, and, and is it right that uh, almost universally or universally scholars agree that Jesus thought of himself at the very least as God's special eschatological agent or God's agent to bring about the kingdom on earth? And he said, yes, that is almost universally uh, agreed upon by scholars. So what so people have said those two things before, but I really wanted to underscore it. So what I said was, I said, OK, look, you guys, you know, normally when you bring a case for the resurrection, people will say the old Carl Sagan thing of, well, this is an extraordinary claim. And so we need extraordinary evidence that will overcome uh, the implausibility inherent to any supernatural claim like this or a miracle claim. And I said, I'd like to head that off with something that I call recalibrated plausibility. And so what is recalibrated plausibility? Well, if God did not exist or if Jesus was just any other first century Jew, well, then, yeah, it'd be incredibly implausible to say that Jesus was risen from the dead. But and this is really important, these two features. One, by this point in my opening statements, I had already shown that God exists. So we've got God in play. And then secondly, uh, it's, it's understood by scholars, and I was ready to defend it, you know, with, act, with the facts that scholars actually rely upon, that Jesus thought of himself as God's agent. And here's the analogy I gave for that that I think is really helpful. And that is, uh, let's imagine that you went into a coffee shop and you encountered this group of people who were so excited that they had just seen this guy, Neil, walking on the moon. They saw a video of this guy named Neil walking on the moon. Now, let's imagine that you don't know anything about NASA. And you don't know anything about space exploration and, or the moon landing. Uh, the claim that these people are making that they saw a guy named Neil walking on the moon is an extraordinary claim. And we would expect there to, I mean, it's incredibly implausible. We yeah. need some extraordinary. How, how does a man get to the moon? Right, right. If you don't know anything about the space exploration, right? So, but then let's imagine that later that day, uh, you do become aware of a couple of facts. One, 
there was this org there is this organization called NASA and in the 1960s they were doing something and they had the power to do space exploration and they had the power to get a man to the moon if they wanted to and you also find out that there was this guy named Neil in the 1960s walking around saying that he was a part of NASA's special program as if he was carrying around a sign saying just watch my life and see what I do as a part of NASA's special program okay now the analogy should be pretty easy to figure out when you go back to your friends in the coffee shop is now is their claim implausible no it's very plausible what happened well it wasn't that there was extraordinary evidence it was that we recalibrated the plausibility for our discussion with these extra facts so before i ever get to the resurrection i want to say look god is like nasa in that we've now given good reason to believe that he exists and he's the sufficient power to do something like a resurrection and jesus thought of himself as god's special kingdom agent as if he was like Neil holding up a sign saying, look what I do as a, part of the, as a part of this special program. Now with those two things in place, now are the claims that we get in the rest of the resurrection case, you know, like that, that people were claiming that they saw there is in Jesus and they were willing to die for it and all those kind of things. Are those implausible now? No, now they're incredibly plausible. What have we done? We've recalibrated the plausibility. And if it works in the NASA analogy, I think it works in the Jesus analogy. And the only real criticism that I've heard of this misses the point of the analogy and criticizes the analogy instead of the point and says, yeah, but we have good reason to believe in NASA and all these things. Well, right. But if you don't think we have good reason to believe that God exists, then we need to back off of the resurrection case, go back to the theistic arguments and do some more work there so that when we get to the resurrection case, this works. Yeah, nice. I like uh, how you've come up with the terminology, re recalibrated plausibility, uh, because what, what you're doing there you're talking about Bayesian probability theory. Um, <laughs> you're talking about background evidence and, and how we need to consider the background evidence when we consider an event occurring. So, But you do it in a way that's very likely easier to understand than, than Bayes' theorem. <laughs> well, it's going to be easier to understand because I'm not a Bayesian and I don't really <laughs> know how to do that. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I only know how to do it, uh, you know, with analogies, right? So I'm not somebody like Blake Gento or Tim McGrew or somebody who understands beige and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Good. All right. So so you talked about all that bef before presenting the case for the resurrection. Then, yeah. then what did you say for the case for the resurrection? So for the resurrection, I used some really simple facts. Uh, like most people, since the minimal facts approach of Gary Habermas, I, uh, you know, most people will have an arrangement of facts that are usually the bedrock facts, which I know you've got a podcast for, with Mike, so people are probably familiar from listening to that, that a bedrock fact uh, counts as, a, as, as such if it, it has two things going for it. One, it's highly evidenced. And two, it enjoys the consensus of critical scholarship. So I only used bedrock facts, and I really only used these: that Jesus died, um, that he, that people thought that the, people had experiences that they interpreted as the risen Jesus after his death, um, and that those people were willing to die for the claim. And uh, that was really pretty much it, you know, uh, because I think when you combine those features. With, and of course, those, there are subcategories underneath those, like you know, um, the First Corinthians 15 creed, and uh, you know who exactly had these appearances, and you know why can we trust the gospels? There's all kind of subcategories under those. Right. But um, but those three were pretty much it, because I think when you combine those with the pre-crucifixion uh, features that we just described with the recalibrated plausibility, I think you have a good a good standing to make the resurrection conclusion yep it's a uh when when you look at the the bedrock facts how is one to be consistent in all and understanding all of these facts and what's the hypothesis that best fits them uh, non-believers have to they have to disagree with one of the facts in order to escape out of it and that's yeah. where that's where the rub is that they have to go against the grain of scholars who say you know, we've got all this good evidence to think this is the case. Empty tomb, you know, all, all that stuff. Early appearances, mo multiple early appearances. So that's that's one of the reasons why I'm a Christian, because in order to get out of it, you've got to do away with some of one or some of the other facts. Right. And, you know, um, what this is, this is really key here for people that watch the debate or who have watched it is 
notice something. The debate question was, does the Christian God exist, right? So the specifically Christian case that I brought was the resurrection. Both of the previous arguments could be used for a number of, uh, you know, theistic other theistic positions. Religions. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't use the free will argument with Islam, <laughs> but you could use, but with these other things, you could, you could, you know, with the Kalam and with the free will argument, you could with most of these monotheistic religions. But this is the specifically Christian thing. And he had been preparing for another debate on the resurrection. So I expected, trying to think about tactics here, I needed to bring a case for God's existence before I got to the resurrection so that I could do this, you know, have a, have a good explanatory hypothesis for the resurrection that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? But Dillahunty didn't have that. All Dillahunty would have to do is to, if he wanted to, was just challenge the resurrection. If he could knock down the resurrection, he would have succeeded in uh, in overturning the debate question or giving a negative answer or an I don't know answer to the debate question, does the Christian God exist, right? So, but he didn't do that. In fact, all he really said about the resurrection was some passing comments like, well, I don't care what the scholars say, which I was, it's not in the video, but I was back there shaking my head vigorously, nodding my head because I was happy to talk about why the scholars say what they do, mm. but he never, he never challenged me in the cross examination or in the audience Q and a on the resurrection. And I specifically asked him toward the beginning of the cross examination, is it the case that you're not going to bring a competing hypothesis to the resurrection? And he said, correct. And then we just moved on to talk about the free will argument and the Kalam for the rest of the debate. Well, as you know, if you're not going to bring a competing hypothesis, then you didn't come to the histo historiography game. That's how we do this. We compare hypothesis, hypotheses. And I'll say something more bombastic than what Mike Lycona would say. Uh, he's too scholarly to say something like this. But the reason that nobody wants to bring a competing hypothesis, the reason that you have guys like Airmen actually in the past having said you shouldn't try to bring a, a competing hypothesis is because every time someone does, as you just said, as you just illustrated, it gets shredded by the Christian side of the debate. And so... They just don't bring one. Yeah, and in terms of debate tactics and 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 how how you win a debate, if you if you have a dropped point, um, you you lose that point in the debate. Yeah. I mean, if you don't respond to it, boom, point point to Braxton's side. So, especially if that point is the very question that we're here <laughs> to discuss, you know. Yeah, right, right. Good. Braxton, we've got to take a, a short break here. Uh, when we come back, though, I want to um, get your thoughts more on, uh, and you've already clued us in a little bit about how he responded uh, to your arguments, and I want to hear about the cross-examination. And there was a question from a, a fellow named Drew that attended uh, the debate uh, that's a very fascinating short little video on YouTube I saw. I want to get your thoughts on that. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. Striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Let's say there's this Christian apologist. You love their message, but have trouble finding their videos, their articles, or social media posts. How do you stay connected to them? We're on it. Defenders Media uses the tools of the digital age to create content for your favorite apologists. We give them more screen time, more digital soapboxes, and more presence to deliver more of the content that you love. That's what we do. I know that social media is important to those of you who follow my work. Many respond to my videos and posts on Facebook and Twitter, but it becomes impossible after a while to keep up with it all and to continue with research. That's why I'm thrilled that we have found a solution, Defenders Media. Whether it's a website, whether it's printed material, whether it's a question on graphics, I cannot do what I do and reach my audience without the help of Defenders Media. They have been integral in helping me to reach my audience. Defenders Media ensures consistent content reaches your hand from today's leading apologists and apologetic ministries. 
like Mike Lycona, Apologetics 315, the Veracity Hill podcast with Kurt Jarris, and more. To learn more, text the word DEFENDERS to 555-888 and we'll send you a free PDF of the top five ways to share the gospel online. that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, visit our website, veracityhill.com. We would love to get your sponsorship for our program. If you want to get your logo up on our website with a link to your homepage, uh, it could be your business or your organization, perhaps even your ministry. We'd love to help support you uh, in addition to uh, you supporting us. So thank you for your consideration. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that at veracityhill.com and click on that patron tab. Those are folks that just chip in a few bucks each month. If you are one of our devoted listeners, I want to encourage you to give us a review on iTunes or the Google Play Store or even just a Facebook page review. All of that is helpful for people that are just encountering our ministry here. So thanks for your consideration and supporting us in those ways. On today's program, I'm joined by Dr. Braxton Hunter. He's the president of uh, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. There, I, I got it right there, Braxton, down in Ev- Evansville, Indiana. And um, I'm sure it's a bit warmer in Evansville than it is up here in Chicago. Probably, but I think we both wish we were in Florida. <laughs> Uh, now we've had um, we've had Braxton on the program before, so we've done rapid questions already. We've got to know you a little bit. For those that want to go back and and listen just to that rapid questions, go go search our uh, our archive for the episode on uh, evangelistic apologetics. I believe we titled it. So that was a great great time chatting with you, and uh, you certainly do have that heart as a an evangelist slash apologist. You do that well, and that's one of the things I like about you. Is, uh, because that's what it's about, really. You know, sometimes folks are really into the apologetics, and they you got to think, what's it for? What's it for? It's about bringing people to Christ, and right. so you can't lose sight of that goal. All right. In the first half of the program, we um, talked about sort of your opening arguments uh, that you brought to your debate, uh, your recent debate against Matt Dillahunty. He is the uh, the atheist uh, host of the Atheist Experience, a long time uh, YouTube program. Does he air it on TV? I'm not. I'm not even sure. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's uh, it's cable. out of Austin, Texas. And I think it's uh, televised. Yeah, in parts of Texas. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. elsewhere. So he's been doing that for I think like 20 years now, and has a very large following, a lot of support, loads of subscribers on YouTube, and it's very important for Christians to engage with folks uh, like that out there on the internet. And so I applaud you, Braxton, for engaging uh, in a debate with him. Okay, so you had three arguments that you brought forward, the libertarian free will argument, the Kalam, or, which is a, a subset of cosmological arguments, and then the case for the resurrection. You said before we went to a break that he basically just dropped the resurrection and didn't respond to it at all. So it sounds like in his – was it in his opening speech that he just dealt with the two or did he wait for his rebuttal time? You know, he, he takes debate seriously, and he does try to follow the conventions of these debates. And so um, he didn't respond in his opening statement to anything I said in my opening statement. Wait, right, which is the proper way to do it. A lot of people don't right. know that, but yeah. Right. And so instead, he, in his rebuttal, was when he uh, was when he did say some things about the resurrection, but they were really just, I don't know why I should believe something just because a bunch of other people believed it, and I don't care what scholars say. Now, I didn't get a second rebuttal. After that, we went right into cross X. So I didn't get to deal with those or, you know, say anything else. So the way I kind of just dealt with that was in the cross examination. I just said, are you not going to give me a competing hypothesis for the resurrection or, you know, and and I don't know if I don't think I said this, but the sentiment was, are you not going to deal with this that I brought, you know, and he he said, correct. I'm not going to bring a competing hypothesis. So that was just left standing, you know, for the rest of the debate. Yeah. Okay. So he did take time to reply to your first two arguments. So how did he respond to the uh, libertarian free will argument? So in his rebuttal, he just said, uh, you know, basically, I don't believe in free will and I don't believe in God. So I don't know how this could possibly be convincing. And then with the uh, Kalam, he just pointed out the Kalam is not an argument for God. So, you know, that takes care of the Kalam. There may have been more to it than that, but I don't recall. 
there being much more. But the really the action happened there in the cross examination. So uh, I got the first, you know, it went six minutes, me questioning him, six minutes of him questioning me, then five minutes and five minutes. So I started off. So I asked him first. And now I thought about this because if you watch his debates and if you're a person watching this who ends up debating him at some point, I think this is key. Matt's epistemology and what he requires in order to believe something is really slippery. Now, I'm not saying that as a slight to Matt. I'm just saying it's difficult to figure out and deal with. So I've heard him say before, as recently as Christmas, that he doesn't believe we can have certainty about anything, including our own existence. And we're talking about like Cartesian certainty, absolute certainty. Yeah. And so I said, is that the case? And he said, that's right. I said, okay. So I said, now, when you have often said we shouldn't believe something until it's been demonstrated, right? That's right. Okay. What does that mean? Because here's the thing with Matt, whenever he says something, we, we have to demonstrate, say that the Christian God exists before we should believe it. He never clarifies what that looks like. And he's even admitted in the past, he doesn't know what it looks like. And I was going to ask him and I backed off of it because I thought it sounded too snarky, but I was going to ask him, okay, if you don't even know what you mean when you're asking me for a demonstration, is it fair to characterize what you're saying is that you don't even know what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't, <laughs> I decided not to say that. Yeah. So, so anyway, the point I wanted to make was you're asking us for a demonstration. You don't know what that demonstration looks like. So we give you a bunch of evidence and you say, that's not a demonstration. Oh, so you want certainty. Oh, no, no, no. Can't have certainty. You just want a demonstration then. Yeah. Okay. Here's some more evidence. Ah, oh, that's not a demonstration. It's not a shifting of the goalpost. There's not even a goalpost. Mm. And so it's very slippery to try to deal with. So we dealt with that. Then we went into the free will argument. And he misunderstood the argument um, a little bit. He, you know, one of the defenses that I give and that guys like, say, Tim Stratton give is in defense of premise two, which is all he addressed, which is the claim that libertarian freedom does exist. Um, all he really, you know, so I, so I defended it by saying, look, here's the thing. First of all, this is kind of like the principle of credulity, you know, and this is how Craig defends premise two of the moral argument is, look, it's not just that I believe this just because I feel like I have libertarian freedom. But it's also that a good argument has premises that are plausible. And what we mean by that are the premise is more likely to be true than false. That's a good argument it has premises like that. So um, any argument that is meant to show me that I don't have libertarian freedom will be built on premises. It will have one or more premises that are less plausible than my immediate experience right now that I do have libertarian freedom. So it's, it's not exactly, it's kind of oafish to characterize it as, well, you just think you have libertarian freedom because you feel like you do. And that's, that's, that's not what we're, we're saying something a bit more sophisticated than that, but he didn't respond to that. And so then, and I, I know I'm just kind of going off here. I don't mean to railroad the conversation, but the, the, the next thing, and the only other thing we really got to with that is, and this is what Tim Stratton would, would argue alongside me is that look, if you don't have libertarian freedom, then rational affirmations are impossible. Rational affirmations. Now, what we mean by that is um, rationality definitionally is reducible to reason. And reason is the process of deliberation where you think about facts and you choose, you choose which thing you should affirm. Well, if you don't have libertarian freedom, then every step of that cognitive process is determined and you weren't making any choices so that you just find yourself believing whatever you believe, even though you went through the steps and it felt like you were making those choices. So you can affirm things, but you can't rationally affirm them because beliefs aren't rational. Beliefs are true or false. Persons are rational. So as a result, you just find yourself believing these things and you have to just assume that you're right. So you can affirm things and you might even be correct, but you can't rationally affirm them. And his counterexample of this, that this is the only thing he said in response, then I'll hush and let you say something uh, on your own show. I'll let you say something. Um, but the only thing he said is like, well, yeah, but that, I don't believe that at all, because calculators uh, are purely determined things that give you, you know, almost 100 percent, if not 100 percent correct answers. But this misses the point and kind of makes the point for me. Right. Uh, computers, a, a calculator is a machine. Right. That's right. <laughs> and just like on your view, you're a machine, you can get to right answers, but you can't rationally affirm those right answers. Even if you were 100% right about everything, like the calculator is, you could be right and you could affirm all those right things, 
but you couldn't rationally affirm those right things because you have no justification for claiming that you reliably got to those answers. You got to those answers the same way as the man who believes that he's a pink unicorn got to that answer. You were determined and every step of the way it was determined. Right. And he just basically said, I don't accept that and moved on. So that was kind of the end of the free will discussion. Huh. So yeah, that's, that's fascinating. He brought up a calculator analogy. Yeah. That is that is a really uh, awful analogy for his position to use. <laughs> right, right. Well, it works if you're th- if if what you think is that the theist is saying that your beliefs are rational or irrational, like that the Ohio River is out the window right now of where I'm sitting. Uh, that's a rational belief. No, no, no. That's a true belief. Right. Uh, but rationality has to do with the process of my getting to that belief. So that little hiccup would make his analogy work if that's what I was yeah. saying, but it wasn't. Working. Right. You weren't you weren't saying that a- the consistent atheist couldn't come to true beliefs. That wasn't what you were debating. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, certainly mistaken there. And then, you know, when you're thinking about this form, this process of deliberation, um, the the atheist might think, oh yeah, of course I'm thinking and evaluating, but you've got to be consistent here. Is this is it genuine, right, or is it just illusory? And on, if atheism were true, then it's just illusory. So it's yeah, a- and I love Tim Stratton's analogy for this because um, for those that don't know, Tim Stratton is at Free Thinking Ministries. He has his own uh, free will argument, but it's not the same as mine. Uh, it's substantially different. But uh, but anyway, he he points this out on this point. He says, look. He said, imagine that you just found out that while you're listening to this podcast, that there's a mad scientist who's controlling your every thought, your every belief, your every action, including whatever you're thinking about right now as I'm speaking and the next words that are going to come out of your mouth. Now, if that if you found that out, could you would you be justified in trusting anything that you believe? You know, because you don't know the motivations of this mad scientist. And it's actually worse than that because there's not even a mad scientist if atheism is true. It's just the natural blind processes of the universe. Yep, yep. All right, so now the Kalam argument. Um, You said earlier he kind of dismissed that as well, uh, that it's not for the Christian God. Is that all he said in response to it? No, so he would have, but I pressed him on it here. So when I, you know, in my first cross-examination, I brought the free will argument, and he stayed on it for his. But then in my second round, I brought up the Kalam and he stayed on it for his, which was shocking to me. But what he basically said was he didn't want he didn't care about these different premises. And the problem is, and I pointed this out to him, is, you know, because he'll often say, let's just let's just grant the Kalam and move forward. The problem is then he'll later raise concerns that would have been addressed by the Kalam. That's why we begin with the Kalam, you know. Um, so anyway, I pressed him on, does the universe have a beginning? And he says, I don't know. And I didn't respond to that tonight. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. And I'm like, well, okay. But uh, so either the universe is past infinite. It's just always existed forever and ever and ever, or it's not, which is it? He's like, I don't know. Really? And I said, well, how, yeah. And I said, well, how could it possibly be past infinite? And he said, how could your God be past infinite? Now the clear-minded, you know, initiated apologists out there know instantly the answer to this is we don't say that God is past infinite. We say that God is timeless. Timeless. (laughs) And so I said to him, thinking that he was well-versed enough in this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude. He really does try to understand these arguments. I just don't think he had thought too much about this particular criticism is I said, look, um, I said, he's, I said, he's time. We believe he's timeless. And he interpreted that, and it didn't become clear to me until a few moments later. He interpreted me to mean by that he's he's past infinite. He just is. That's what we believe. Yeah. But And so he said, well, I don't care what you believe. I, I want to know why you believe that. And I said, well, you're asking me definitionally a question about the Christian God. I'm telling you he's timeless. And he got really frustrated, and I said, what I'm saying is we don't have the problem of past infinite because he's timeless since creation. He's like, oh, well, you didn't say that till just then. <laughs> well, I had said it because the— because I said he was timeless and past infinite is temporal language. Right. But anyway, so uh, anyway, we got, so he said, well, maybe, maybe he said, here's the response. He says, here's the response. If time began with the physical universe, then the, it wouldn't be past infinite. And I was like, 
right. <laughs> so, so what was this whole song and dance about, right? And uh, he said, well, I never said it was past infinite. I said, you said you didn't know. And he's like, right. And he got really frustrated. And this was the most frustrated he got with me in an otherwise cordial debate. He said, the thing is, I'm not a physicist and I don't claim to know. And the problem with you apologists who are also usually not physicists is you do claim to know. And then I, and this, if I have a proud moment in the debate, which you got to give me at least one, the freedom to be carnally proud about one thing <laughs> is I just kind of casually responded. Why do you need to be a physicist to understand the philosophical point that the universe can't be past infinite or we would have never arrived at this present moment? So anyway, I felt like the Kalam discussion was a slam dunk, if I do say so. <laughs> yeah, nice. Good, good. All right. I want to move the discussion here. Um, to the the audience Q and A, and I've I've watched this short little video uh, that we'll, we'll put up at our website along with our program here of a, of a fellow. I guess his name from on Facebook, if I can say his name is Drew, um, yeah. and he he asks um, Matt about the question of of whether he's an atheist. I mean the program the the title of Dill Hunty Show is the Atheist Experience. Um, and so what was Matt's, uh, response here on, on atheism? Yeah, you do need to watch the video clip to get the force of this, but you know, Matt is very clear. Like a lot of newer atheists are that I'm not claiming that there is no God. I'm claiming, I'm just saying I remain unconvinced. I lack a belief in God, right? That's atheist. Well, you and I both know that Drew is right, that traditionally that would be defined as, that would be like agnosticism, you know? I, I just don't know, you know? Um, and maybe a strong agnosticism because he would say, I don't think you know either. You right, know? right. Maybe <laughs> um, a nihilism, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. But atheism is defined in almost all of the literature as uh, one who, an atheist is one who maintains that there is no God, right? right. So, uh, and we had a, one, a, a professor uh, who listens to our show come on and, and kind of say, if, if we took his definition, atheism could be true and theism could be true at the same time, you know? Yeah. Uh, the claim, lack of belief, of, the, the statement, lack of belief in God doesn't even enjoy the benefit of being true or false. Yeah, unless it's, 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 not, it's not a metaphysical claim. It's an epistemological claim. I lack right. a belief. So right. right. So the Christ God could exist, and Dillahunty could lack that belief. They could both be true. <laughs> right. But now, for atheists who may listen to this and think I'm being disingenuous, uh, there's so when he brought that, he and Dillahunty got into a bit of a back and forth, and Dillahunty basically told him to go away. <laughs> he said, "If you don't care what I think about it, why are you at my event? Go away." So uh, when so I didn't know that that this Drew that we're talking about is a listener to our podcast, Trinity Radio. And I didn't know that. And he had driven three hours to be there for this event because he appreciates me and, and the work we do. And so I felt really bad about this. I didn't know that at the time. But I do have a personal principle that when you're, for academic reasons, it's important to point out the definitional differences yep. here, right? But in evangelism, I, I don't think we need to concern ourselves with that. We just need to understand why the person is calling themselves what they're calling themselves. So I don't care if you call yourself an alligator and you mean by alligator, one who lacks a belief in God. Okay, alligator, let's talk about your lack of belief in God. I don't right. care what you call yourself right? because I'm interested in reaching the person. But it is important for academic discussions like we're having right now about this. And so Drew's right, but I, but in the moment, number one, I saw an opportunity to extend an olive branch and show some camaraderie with my opponent. And I do think it was important to make that point I just made about evangelism and really talking to people and not just trying to win arguments. Yeah. So I told him, so I said that basically, I said, look, I'm going to take up for Matt here. And, and I said that, well, Drew likely feels, you know, slighted by that because, uh, and he told me he didn't, he said, I knew you didn't know who I was or anything. And I've actually heard you say that before, but he is, <laughs> Of the people who were involved in this debate, either as a questioner, a moderator, or a debate participant, uh, you would think I'd be the most hated on the theist side. <laughs> no, no. Drew is the most hated <laughs> in most people's minds uh, from the atheists. And that is entirely unfair. And so please allow me to just say this very briefly. Drew 
told me, told us in our Facebook group privately, and, um, and I know he wouldn't mind for me to say this, is that he didn't mean to come off the way that he did. There was a person behind him in a wheelchair trying to, you know, get in line and he was having to move the microphone. And so some of his responses back to Matt sounded abrupt. And in fact, when he said, I, you know, it doesn't matter to me what you call yourself. And then Matt cuts him off and says, well, then go away. He was trying to then say what I always say, which is it doesn't really matter to me what you call yourself. It just matters what you mean. But I wanted to ask the question. So it, he didn't mean this the way it came off. And all of the vitriol against him is, is overblown, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone's got to be the villain. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So uh, one of the common lines I like to take when uh, I'm engaging with atheists and, and they say, um, you know, well, I just lack a belief. I mean, by that definition, then rocks are atheists because rocks too right. lack belief that God exists. So it's it's yeah. not a helpful definition by any means to say that you right. just you know lack that. So the traditional definition, which I think Drew provides in this video, he cites from numerous academic sources. You know, the atheism is the belief is the um, uh, you know. Affirmed position or or the denial of God's existence is not just this lack of belief. It's a metaphysical claim. There is no God. So I think you're right, no. though. The way that Matt describes himself and from other things he said in the debate, it's that he is um, just agnostic, you know, maybe a strong agnostic. They just can't know. Yeah. So. Yeah, one other thing. Uh, there's another video that somebody made uh, where somewhere Matt gets on to me about the libertarian freedom thing and says, this idea that you can, that you're justified in believing something until such time somebody convinces you otherwise is actually a fallacy, he says. And then somebody edited that together where earlier or later in the debate, he says, he says exactly the same thing. He says, now I can't prove that I exist and that other people actually exist, but I'm fine with the notion that other people actually exist until such a time as somebody convinces me I'm wrong. So he basically says the same thing. It's a flat contradiction between those two statements. And somebody put a video together illustrating that, which I thought was neat. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. Because he's it's in, in the same context. You know, he's talking about what would be, you know, required for us to to change our beliefs, you know, if, yeah. if evidence came to light. And so there he's presenting two different co contradictory statements. Fascinating. So what's been, let me ask you, what's been your feedback of the debate? Um, I mean, you've, I guess, been keeping tabs on what atheists are saying online. Well, all the atheists think that I believe in unicorns and Santa Claus and, uh, you know, all, all the things that you typically hear. Don't you, Braxton? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, you know, what's interesting um, is they'll say that th this, there's more than one comment. Go look. that says this. They'll say, Oh, these apologists, they always bring the same old arguments that we've heard a thousand times, nothing new. And we hate this new free will argument that we've never heard before. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a, they don't even, I think they just copy paste mentally from their previous debate that they said this about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Their but, previous comment two minutes ago from some other debate they were watching. Right. Right. So, um, but the, the, so the atheists are going to be atheists. Now, some of the atheists have said there was, there's one comment that, that was to Matt that said something like, um, you know, Matt, this guy was way more prepared than I think you were. And you came, it was like you were in the preseason and he was going for the Super Bowl or something. You know? uh, so that was nice. There were some people that said that even though they think Matt, you know, Matt's their hero and Matt wins all the time and all this, they said that I, you know, that this debate was better than anybody's ever done with Matt, which is really helpful. Hmm. Uh, there have been people in the community, you know, that, uh, like Mike, Mike Lycona helped me prep for this debate. He was thrilled with it. He said the only thing he could possibly criticize about it was that in my opening statements, I talked a little too fast, um, which if that's all Mike Lycona has to say negative about my debate, then I, I'm thrilled, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's been overwhelmingly positive from the people that mean the most to me. Um, again, the only real criticisms have been superficial uh, and, and usually they've just been, you know, like Mary Jo Sharp agreed with like kind of that I'm, I spoke too fast in my opening. So, you know, but aside from that, I mean, uh, it's been overwhelmingly positive and that's me, you know, one thing about the nature of the internet is those people, even the ones that you like, even your friends, even other Christians and theists, 
you, you get to hear what they're saying behind your back because all you have to do is search your name on Facebook, you know? Yeah. And so uh, I, th I think, I think the feeling is good about the debate and I'm certainly pleased with it. Nice. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. What's uh, what's up next on the horizon for you? Um, are you preparing for a next debate? Or are you going to take it easy now a little bit? <laughs> yeah. My wife doesn't want me to ever debate again because <laughs> I, I do get stressed out and everything, but um I've got to do, I'm working on a D men, uh, and my dissertation has been accepted or my, uh, major writing project, I guess has been accepted and it is on discipleship and apologetics. So, um, I need to do the project there and try to get that done. I'm publishing the free will argument as a journal article. And so I'm trying to wrap that up. And, um, uh, I've got this documentary that people might not know about that. I've got to go to Canada here in a couple of weeks and, do some post work on that. Uh, they could see a trailer for that. It's called The Journey. If they just go to my YouTube channel, it's featured video there. They can go to BrooksonHunter.com and it's the first thing that pops up. Um, it's a documentary on the seven churches in early Christianity in uh, Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. So look forward to that. Nice. Yes, very nice. So keep us posted on, on the progress there and we'll help promote it uh, when it's released. And if you want to be a keyboard warrior for me, you could go argue, you listeners, with these, uh, try to evangelize these YouTube atheists on the comment thread uh, of the YouTube video. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. It won't cost you anything. It'll really help me out. Yep. Great. Braxton, thanks so much for coming on our program today and for uh, sure. reviewing the debate. Uh, I, From what it sounds like and from what, I, what I've read uh, online as well, sounds like you did a great job. Uh, so, you. so glad to hear that and give, uh, Matt a run for his money. So <laughs> hope so. All right. God bless you. We'll be in touch. Thanks brother. All right. Well, if you, uh, want to learn more about Braxton and his work, uh, you can go to braxtonhunter.com. Also check out Trinity Sem. That's, uh, the, uh, school where he is the president at. Again, that's the shortened version. It's Trinity College, uh, and, uh, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary at trinitysem.edu. Uh, coming up on next week's program, we are looking at a political topic. It's been a while since we've done that. Uh, but as you uh, might pay attention on our tagline, Striving for Truth on Faith, Politics, and Society, we're, we're going to be talking about the supposed the Green New Deal uh, opportunity here that has been raised in Congress uh, to, to renew, uh, bring renewable energy to America and to retrofit literally every building uh, with uh, energy efficiency and to get rid of airplanes and such. We're going to be exploring. I, I mean, when I say that, I'm, I'm literally not kidding. Uh, that's part of the proposed Green New Deal. We're going to be bringing some experts from the Heartland Institute to be enlightening us about that and why that why some people might think that's a good idea and uh, what some serious issues are with it. So we'll be exploring the Green New Deal. All right, that does it for the program today. I'm grateful for the continued support that we have with our patrons and the uh, partnerships that we have with our sponsors. And they are, Chris has it up, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, for all the fine work that he does. Uh, for our guest today, Dr. Braxton Hunter, and for, for his heart and intellect uh, for Christ's kingdom. And last but not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.